Thanks, ma'am. Uh, and the chairman of Ukraine's parliament, the Verkhovna Rada, uh, Ruslan Stefanchuk, thank you so much for joining us. It's really a pleasure. I'd like to note uh, that Ukrainian will simultaneous translation, so please do pick up a translation device if you need it. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm actually going to start our discussion with you. Uh, the title of this conversation is Democratic Peace Revisited, the role of parliaments in war. Uh, you have been making rounds in various parliaments um, around Europe, uh, making the case for support for Ukraine. Most recently, you were in France, where you addressed the, the French parliament and you called for the recognition of Holodomor as a genocide. And you also, of course, called for more weapons for Ukraine. Can you tell us a bit more about the message you're trying to convey as you have these conversations and these speeches at various parliaments um, across Europe? First of all, I would like to uh, express my gratitude, deep gratitude for being present at this panel with the honorable and distinguished uh, Ms. Pelosi, this is my honor. And I would like to say that here we are with the extended parliamentary delegation, and we're here also to demonstrate to the whole world the unity of the Ukrainian authorities. Because in the face of war, in the face of challenges that we are currently facing, we are demonstrating to the whole world that Ukrainian government and Ukrainian parliament are united, and we represent not factions and groups, we represent uh, the people of Ukraine. And therefore, I would like to thank everyone who is here with me with the, on this important mission. Regarding the questions related to a uh, large international marathon, Yes, we are in this diplomatic path of activities on the parliamentary level and, of course, on the presidential level and the government of Ukraine. And you know that this is a long marathon which uh, wa had one of, the, of its parts uh, during the visit of the president to France, to Brussels and London. And now we have the continuation of this in Munich. This is the work of the big Ukrainian team, and we are sending one and the same message, that Ukraine can and should win this war. Ukraine needs support. Ukraine needs technological weaponry. And we are addressing the whole world that we should not uh, lose time, because otherwise we will lose our chance and opportunity. And this is the main mes message that we have today for the rest of the world. And if you allow me uh, a couple of points that uh, we are now communicating to our colleagues, also here at the Munich conference. Question number one is weapon supply to Ukraine. Ukraine can win this war if we have contemporary technological weapon and if we have it now urgently. Uh, we say we need it yesterday, so, and when the question is uh, when you need this weapon, we always say we needed it yesterday because the time has passed, and we do want very much the decision of our colleagues to be as fast as the assurance and support of Ukraine. Second is that this is the question related uh, question related to the weapon. I want to quote Winston Churchill, who said, "Give us." the toolkits, the instrument, and we will finish the job. So the same is true for Ukraine. We are asking for instruments. Air defense is one of them. Uh, Long-range missiles, another one. Tanks is another one. And uh, planes, fighter planes, is another one. And the, another block of issues that we raise with our colleagues um, is sanction policy. Uh, soon we will we will see the 10th package of sanctions, and we are grateful to our partners for such activeness in the sanction policy. But if Russia still now has the economic 
possibility to wage war. It means the sanctions somewhere don't work, and our task now is to analyze where they fail and do our lessons learn, because sanctions can be sanctions only when you cannot bypass them through other countries or in other countries, and when the economic pain of this sanction will be felt and will bring aggression to uh, stop the war. And in this sanction, I would also add the full isolation of Russian Federation, because Russian Federation is not the one who should be communicating to G7. This is not the country whose place would be in G20. She doesn't have a place in the Secu Security Council, and she doesn't have a place in the Olympic Games in uh, Paris 2024. Russia, as a virus, has to be contained and be in the quarantine. The third thing we're talking about is the compensation for the damages done to Ukraine, because this is part of justice. The justice being that for the damage, big damage that was incurred by Ukraine, Russia has to be accountable. And item four that we raise is that we have to call things as they are named. The war is war, and the country, terrorist country, is terrorist country without any euphemism or other forms, because this is only fair, and this is only clear, and this has some legal implications as well. Also, we demand justice in terms of creating specialized criminal tribunal against Russian Federation, because uh, she has to be accountable legally, not only in terms of being defeated on the front, but legal accountability in international institutions. It, she has to be acknowledged a criminal state and be punished for this. And the sixth item we are raising is the implementation of the peace formula by uh, proposed by President Zelensky. This is a universal formula which soon will not be a theorem, but rather an axiom. It has to be, it will be accepted by the whole world and supported by the rest of the world, because this is the path to the speedy victory. And the last thing we are talking about is membership in you and NATO. This is, these are two big priorities. We have a candidate status for EU. Ukraine would like to start its uh, progress into NATO membership, and we do hope very much for Vilnius summit. We want to get the invitation to NATO. We want to start the full-fledged negotiations. And the last thing I want to start at the end, I would like also to add that nowadays the whole world is telling us how they are proud of us. And I think it's time for Ukraine to say to the whole world how we are proud of the level of support and joint victory that we are seeing. So thank you for this invitation, and Slava Ukraini. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, of course, President Zelensky spoke uh, here at the Munich Security Conference just yesterday, and he laid out a very similar agenda. Uh, but thank you for really putting a fine and very specific uh, point on what President Zelensky also said. Um, Madam Speaker, if I may, uh, so we just heard from the chairman about the conditions that Ukraine is seeking um, in Russia's uh, brutal war against Ukraine's territorial sovereignty. And of course, the issue that we've all been talking about the last several days is Ukraine winning. Uh, and Mr. Speaker, uh, sorry, Mr. Chairman just said, we need to provide Ukraine everything it needs to be able to win. Are we providing Ukraine what it needs to win? And is that actually our policy in the United States? Thank you very much for um, uh, monitoring our conversation this evening. Oh, yeah. Thank you for monitoring our conversation, for sharing your background and your uh, knowledge of this important subject. It's an honor to be with Speaker Stubbenchuk, and I'll pick up where he left off. Salva Grani. You can all say that, you know. Okay? You ready? Hello, Salva. Usually this. <laughs> Salva. In any event, what the speaker has laid out, we call him speaker, but we've been calling him speaker for more than a year now, so. But in any event, as has been indicated, one year ago, the, the president of Ukraine came here, issued the warning that was there, challenged us. Uh, by saying, you know, wh where is the uh, security structure 
of the of the Western world and uh, the free world, we are we're on the verge of a Russian initiation of hostilities. We need help. And then he went home. But it was a real her uh, clarion call, challenge to conscience. It was wonderful. Uh, it, it, and of course, within 24 hours, uh, the Russians invaded. The uh, U.S. was useful in terms of our intelligence, which was telling NATO, this is going to happen. We know that this is going to happen. But to get to uh, this, uh, so relating the list that the speaker gave us to a chronology, uh, sometime right after that, we passed a bill, $12 billion in the Congress to send there. Then we went uh, to uh, Kiev. Uh, we had a delegation that went to Kiev the first couple of days of May, where President Zelensky gave us again the agenda, some of the issues at that time relating to four things, uh, relating to uh, military assistance, humanitarian assistance, economic assistance, and humanitarian assistance, enumerating how many people are in the country, outside, the refugees outside, displaced within, and what the needs were, very specifically in terms of numbers and in terms of kind of weapons that were needed. We came back, and then that Within a few weeks, we passed a $40 billion package, 39 point something, I think, a package for Ukraine in a very bipartisan way, in a very bipartisan way. Uh, then following that, we had, okay, in April, we had the um, a season freeze. In May, we had Lend-Lease. So every few weeks, we had a different bill. So his first thing is the, mil the equipment. And that has changed over time. What we asked for, when we came back in May and asked for was a must-have list, and we did eventually get that, but then we have it more and more. Now we want uh, the F-16s, and I fully support uh, what, and, and I'm hopeful that that will happen. I don't see why we can't be training on them now, even if we don't have a full Absolutely. commitment to have them, because it will take a while to train. So uh, that was the main part of the additional additional. But, okay, secondly, we talked about uh, sanctions. The sanctions are very important, but they have to work, as the uh, speaker said. Part of the sanctions uh, um, were, as I said, in the seize and freeze. We would freeze, we would seize the, uh, the um, assets of the Russians, and we would freeze them, thaw them out later, to go to one of your further points, to rebuild Ukraine with Russian money, with Russian money. Uh, uh, then we talked about uh, them as an aggressive uh, a terrorist nation, uh, and we have legislation, one form or another, that we will pass in a bipartisan way. We've been working on it for a while, and we had working on the legalities and this or that. Fourth point, war is war. Call it war. Well, I, you know, I don't know how the Russians think they can get away with calling it anything else, uh, but they do. And uh, again, when we're talking about uh, uh, accountability, I'm not sure if this was five or within, uh, accountability. There's accountability for the individual acts of rape as an, a weapon of war and kidnapping thousands of children and taking them to the far reaches. I think some of those children are closer to Alaska now than they were to Ukraine. They've taken them. To, these are sins, crimes against humanity. Those people should be held accountable. But I was told that there's nothing a Russian soldier does that he doesn't get, hasn't been given orders to do, which takes us to another level of a, a d definition of a terrorist country, and that is aggressive, aggressor nation, which means that the hierarchy of the government is held accountable for what happens in war. We can do ours in terms of uh, 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 behavior of individuals and the rest. The other aggressor, that's an act of uh, the United Nations, so that's something that's going to take some, a little more work and little, uh, a little more time. But the, um, the, whether it's, again, among those four things and th that the 10 lists were, humanitarian assistance has been 
vast coming from the United States. Germany is the second largest uh, uh, contributor to the cause one way or another. But so many countries have been so generous in welcoming uh, refugees. But there are plenty of humanitarian assistance that is needed within within, uh, and you all have made this clear to us along the way, whether they're displaced persons or people living in war zones and really don't have too many options, they need humanitarian assistance. The economic assistance is really important. They need money for the budget, they need money to pay the teachers, to pay those soldiers and the rest of that, and they need outside investment into, into um, Ukraine. They need outside investment even now, even now, the outside and economic investment. And so we're hoping in our meetings along the way that we can be a source of it and encouraging that. So humanitarian, economic, weapons we talked about, and uh, again, just the idea that these people have so much courage. They're fighting for democracy. I've been told that I should use different language. Last night at a meeting they said, You're, if you want it to be appealing, you should say they're fighting for freedom. Now, I don't oh know, you, you tell me, that we're fighting for freedom and liberty, and that's something that resonates with everybody in the world, even if they're not definitely in favor of a democracy. Matter of discussion. But in any event, yes, to your question, yes, I believe the United States is living up uh, to our, as our Vice President spoke so beautifully today, to our values and to the strategic uh, necessity of our assisting um, uh, Ukraine. And of course, we want to get those airplanes, we want the air power, and that remains to be seen, but hopefully on the front burner, I yield back. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Madam Speaker, and thank you so much for your leadership. Um, in the many years you have spent, of course, um, in the House of Representatives, ensuring that we had bipartisan support for Ukraine and the many packages we passed through the U.S. Congress to ensure that that happens. May I just ask a follow-up question? Thank you for laying out the agenda that you're seeking to achieve um, together with uh, St Speaker Stefanchuk and, and with the Ukrainian people, because I do want to highlight that this is agenda for the Ukrainian people. It's not for the Ukrainian government. Of course, it represents the Ukrainian people, really talking about the entire country. And this has, what you're laying out here, of course, has massive public support in Ukraine. President Zelensky has you know, incredible support in Ukraine. Uh, but in the United States, we're seeing some of the poll numbers, right? We still have very strong bipartisan support, correct me if I'm wrong, but we have very strong bipartisan support in the U.S. Congress both in the Senate and in the House for Ukraine. Uh, we have enshrined that support in our budget for the year. But if we look across you know, the, the public opinion, it is slipping. All, a lot of the public opinion numbers among both parties, though the, the drop is much more significant, of course, on the Republican side, it's slipping. And that's bringing up a lot of concern um, among my Ukrainian colleagues, many of them are here today, also from the Ukrainian parliament, Ukrainian civil society, that uh, Ukraine fatigue is seeping in to U.S. politics. How do you, you know, in, speak to your constituencies to make the case for why the United States should continue to support Ukraine? Well, let me um, respectfully not subscribe to that characterization mm. of where the American people are. There may be people who don't want to spend money or this or that, whatever it might be, but overwhelmingly the American people, they've taken Ukrainians into their homes. They've supported people who have supported these budgets all along. They are for victory. And again, uh, I don't want to give any currency to any uh, press reports that, oh, th it's some weakening. It's the way it is. It, it, it is. it is a message of success, a message of victory. Oh, uh, they ask all kinds of questions. The press asks all kinds of questions. And we're like, why are you asking that? We're just going to win, baby. We're just going to stay in this until we win. And it's about democracy, freedom, liberty, for the Ukrainian people, but for the world. 
And again, I think the Vice President laid it out very well today in terms of values and in terms of strategic necessity for us to hold the line uh, on, on Putin. Uh, I do not fear, I do not fear uh, that, that, that there is any weakening of support for the people of Ukraine, as you characterize it correctly, uh, in all of this. I think that's a very important message to hear uh, from you and from other representatives of the U.S. government here, not just in Munich, but across Europe, because um, as someone that uh, talks to our European allies and colleagues all the time, uh, we do hear an anxiety um, about uh, where the U.S. stands. There's a lot of concern about our elections, et cetera. So I think the more you can take that message home here as you're doing your tours, I think that's very, very important. Well, let me just say, but it's one of the questions that was asked of the Vice President today is, well, you have an election coming up, so how are you going to sustain? That's almost two years away. We want this war to be won by then. That's right. And so what are we asking about a war, in, I mean, an election in 2024, November, when what we're talking mm -hmm. about is winning as soon as possible. That's right, this year. This year. Uh, Speaker Stefan Chuk, let me ask you, um, you know, we know that Russia has already launched a massive new offensive in the Donbas. We've been talking about that here at the Munich Security Conference, of course, elsewhere. Um, Ukraine um, has said that they will prepare, the Ukraine will prepare its own counteroffensive, of course, uh, to win back its own sovereign territory. Uh, but does Ukraine have what it needs now to be able to take back territory? And if not, you've laid out exactly the kinds of systems. We've seen these lists before, uh, the fighter jets, and of course, we just had the leopards. There's a huge lag in deliveries. You, know, you need those things now, not in a month from now, not in three months from now. And we have been delayed for all kinds of different reasons that I think you know better um, than anyone here. But does Ukraine have what it needs now as Russia has already started its offensive and the brutality of the war continues? Does Ukraine have what it needs? Thank you very much for this question, but with your permission, I would like to start with your first question that you asked to, uh, to uh, Nancy Pelosi. You, regarding the fatigue, fatigue uh, about uh, war in Ukraine, I know this narrative is supported uh, very actively by Russian propaganda as well, but we have to be honest that even if there is fatigue, this is not because of war in Ukraine, but this is because Russia is waging war in Ukraine. And this will be just simply honest to say that. On top of this, when we are talking about fatigue, I was um, uh, communicating a lot with the soldiers who are at the front line. One of the members of our parliament, by the way, he's always on the front line. Uh, he was liberating Mikolaev. We can give it up to him, Roman Kostenko, the member of our parliament. And when I talk to uh, soldiers, warriors like this, I ask them, do you have fatigue? They say, no, we don't have fatigue. And look at me with the tired eyes. And they don't have this fatigue because they are fighting on their own land. They're fighting for their families. They're fighting for their children, they're fighting for their future. And if you're asking whether Ukrainians have everything it takes to win, my answer is yes, because we have the spirit uh, that can win over anything. But if you're asking me whether we have all it takes to win now, I would say it may happen if we receive everything that was promised now. And that is a very important narrative that we have to comprehend, that on the, the every other day of bureaucratic prolonging means more Ukrainian lives lost. People who, the, for the values of democracy, freedom, and dignity are sacrificing the most precious what they have, their lives and their health. And in our delegation, we have lots of warriors who participated in this warfare. And they come out, stand out, and they say things to the general audience that make us remember 
that despite all of this uh, chatting, there are real values, uh, freedom, and mutual support, and standing for the right things. And I think this is the, the most precious that Ukraine can give to the rest of the world. We can rust off some of the values that seemed could have been misinterpreted or interpreted differently, but now we know that all the countries that are helping us, and I would like to thank the people of the United States. I would like to thank President Biden. I would like to thank Congress for the uh, powerful bipartisan uh, support. I would like to thank the government of the United States for standing together, and that we have faith in our common victory. Whether Ukrainians have all it takes, yes, we do. Can we have more? Yes, we can. And what will happen as a result? The victory will come faster. Follow-up question, and I will, I will come back to you, Madam Speaker. Just one quick follow-up question for, for the Chairman. Um, you know, uh, I'm curious, and I think it'd be useful for everyone here to hear, uh, that when you're talking to your parliamentarian colleagues, whether it's in France or Germany, all over Europe, especially in Western Europe, I think it's important to know that Ukraine isn't just fighting for itself. Of course, first and foremost, Ukrainians are fighting for themselves. But this is not just Ukraine's war. This is a broader war, as you said, Madam Speaker, for freedom. And not just universal freedom, but Europe's freedom and Europe's security and our freedom in the United States, too, because our freedom is tied to Europe being whole, free, and in peace, and Europe will never be that as long as Ukraine is not whole, free, and in peace. But when you talk to your counterparts in France and Germany, do you hear them say, this is our war too, or not? You know, this situation has drastically changed uh, in the course of this year. When we, we started initially only with the words of support uh, to Ukraine, now whenever I go to any parliament of Europe or any other country of the world, we feel that the majority of the members of the parliament feel this pain and this war as their own pain and their own war. And these are not just fancy words because the majority of them have visited Ukraine already. And I don't need to tell them like uh, uh, Nancy uh, Pelosi uh, uh, just explained what happens in Ukraine because she was there. She saw it for herself. She was there when the enemy was almost near Kyiv. The majority of congressmen and congresswomen that I met were in Ukraine. And I don't need to tell them the story. They know it. More than 50 speakers and vice speakers have come to visit Ukraine after my invitation. I visited the, 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 these uh, places where the war is going on, and I've seen this in their eyes. And I think this honesty in the relationship brings about big support and the feeling that this pain is their pain as well. So I can surely say that the whole world understands that Ukraine is fighting not only for ourselves, not only for this freedom, we are fighting for the right of civilization to exist or against the right of barbari barbarians to destroy civilizations. These are systemic and uh, visionary things. So in the example of Ukraine, we have to prove that the right for freedom, the right for civilization, the right for democracy will win the barbarianism, the arrogance, and darkness, and attempt to bring us back to the 12th century. Because we live in the 21st century and want to walk together because we have the right to do so. Madam Speaker, please. What I wanted to, uh, well, following up on what uh, distinguished speaker said now and just before his your follow-up question, at, uh, at, <laughs> at a security breakfast this morning, a very experienced, talented, respected security leader said, um, in a war, you don't always win because of the things you can count unless you count on the spirit of the people. And that is what is so fabulous to observe when you talk about people not being tired or people getting fatigued or whatever it is that the outside people may have. 
when the soldiers are, are fighting and their families are sacrificing and the rest. So that, that spirit is something that is just lifting everyone up. When you ask about other parliaments, well, this is the biggest we ha um, delegation we have. The Prime Minister of the UK said today it's their biggest delegation, and that is really because of Ukraine. We thought we had the biggest delegation last year without Ukraine, but this far surpasses that. But did you hear that we were very proud to have President Zelensky come before Congress right before Christmas, and the response was just fabulous bipartisan, and prolonged, and fabulous. Then to see him at the uh, Westminster Hall. Did you see that? Did you hear what the parliamentarian said before he spoke and after he spoke and the response that he received? There's almost nothing recent like it. Uh, and, and when I say recent, I mean decades. So I think the... the um, if they were not making this fight, if the Ukrainians were not making this fight, where would we be with NATO? What, what, forgetting, just putting NATO aside for a moment, what about the countries in the region, Moldova, and other countries that do not have a um, Title V, um, Article V uh, protection, and what that means for them? But, so we have a big debt of gratitude to the people of Ukraine, to the courage of their leadership, of the soldiers and the rest. And we're very proud of some Americans who've gone over to join the fight. So thank, thank you, Madam Speaker. I do want to open it up to questions from the audience. I see quite a few uh, distinguished members of the audience here. If anybody wants to come in, um, also online, if you are following the conversation, uh, please feel free to send your questions over, and I'll try to work them in as well. Do I it, see uh, a hand? Yes. Um, Deputy Popescu, please. As you pass the mic, I just want to observe that the Deputy Speaker of the Latvian Parliament is with us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you for a beautiful uh, panel, Madam Speaker and uh, uh, Alina. I would like to, to raise a question which I raised it many times today because I know it's one uh, part of the work that SIPA uh, was doing on, on the Hill and I want to thank you for, for, for that, Alina, for the efforts. Uh, we are talking about the Black Sea region. And uh, I uh, know that many congressmen and senators, and I want to thank also for that, focused and started to, to, to realize the importance of the Black Sea region. I want to ask you, Madam Speaker, uh, according to the fact that you set up the base through the Congress of uh, Omnibus Legislation, and which talks about the Black Sea, if you believe that it's urgent to set up um, a strategy there in that region in order to help more Ukraine and countries like Moldova to insulate the whole, the whole uh, region uh, and, and, and secure the grain crossing and, and, and what yes. will happen in, in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. I share the response that our distinguished Secretary of State made today. Yes, indeed, this is very important. It's not only important to Ukraine. I mean, of course it's important to Ukraine, but important to the region, but important to anyone who depends on food from Ukraine or uh, other uh, uh, exports from Ukraine. So that, uh, that I appreciate the uh, knowledge that you have and the sensitivity on that subject, but you cannot have the total picture unless that would be included, in my view. And Madam Speaker, can I just follow up on the Black Sea security question for a moment? Um, I'm not going to cite some of the media coverage that's been happening the last several days, but um, do you think, and is it the sense of perhaps your colleagues, the Ukraine can be secure if Crimea remains somehow occupied by Russia? Well, this is a very subjective question. Of course, it's all up to the Ukrainians. As far as I'm concerned, and many of my colleagues, we think Russia has to go. It's an embarrassment that they occupied Crimea without the appropriate re uh, reaction to it at the time. and. Um, and 
I, I, maybe uh, Jerry would like to respond to it sure. as well because he speaks uh, not only as a member of the House but as a, uh, a former chair of the NATO par interparliamentary group. Sure. But uh, uh, in my view, no, I appreciate. You. Thank you for saying that on the record, um, Congressman Connolly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Madam Speaker, and I completely agree. Um, I, I would, two points. Russia needs to leave all Ukrainian sovereign territory. They must. Otherwise, otherwise, even if we succeed in pushing them back and occupy most occupied territory, they can use that as a platform in a few years to do it again. Secondly, I would also say none of us ought to be opining about uh, what could be negotiated on behalf of Ukraine. It is up to Ukraine to decide what it is or, or is not willing to put on the table in negotiations. And when you're in the middle of a war, it is not a smart thing to be negotiating away somebody's territory. We saw that with Kissinger and Davos. And it was a remarkable moment. Like, I thought, well, who elected you to decide on behalf of the Ukrainian people as they're fighting and dying for their freedom and democracy that somehow they need to wake up and, and, and start to put their sovereign territory on the table? So I agree completely with Speaker Pelosi. Uh, that's not our call, and this is not the time to be even talking about that while brave men and women are fighting and dying. Thank you, Congressman, for, for that statement. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to come back to you in just a second, but I want to bring in uh, Bor Boris Ruga into the conversation. Ambassador Ruga, please. Thank you very much. Um, welcome, Speaker Pelosi. Um, it's a huge honor to have you back in Munich. Uh, when we were in Washington, D.C. in May um, of last year, you were kind enough to host us at, uh, at Congress, and um, I think that really underlined the close relationship between the MSC and the United States Congress. And so welcome once again here. It's a real pleasure to see you on stage alongside Ruslan Stefanchuk. Um, and I think that is, is very symbolic as well. I don't know whether you've touched on this already because I'm running from one thing to another, but um, um, what I'd be interested in is the, the sort of connection between the US Congress and the RADA in Ukraine um, and how that has worked um, during this conflict and how it has been productive in addressing Russia's aggression. Uh, perhaps you've dealt with that already. If not, I'd be very interested in, in your point of view. Uh, thank you so much, Amb Ambassador Ruga. Um, Madam Speaker, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Okay, well, it, let, let's just say that we've had sort of um, a constant communication between the Congress and the, and the Speaker. Uh, I have had great uh, conversations and communication, but he has that, had that across the aisle, across the Capitol, and the rest. But let me just tell you a few things. So he comes, we give, uh, he makes the pitch, the whole thing, this, uh, we have a, a video from the president, oh, that was a big deal, packed and jammed, Democrats and Republicans, House and Senate. Uh, then we have, uh, then we have um, the First Lady, uh, sh she came in Perth. Fabulous, that's the executive branch. But in terms of, of um, parliament to parliament, this is so important, and as I say, NATO and uh, the interparliamentary group, uh, parliament to parliament is so important because that's where policy is made, that's where money is allocated, uh, uh, especially in the Constitution of the United States says that's the House of Representatives. But then we've met other places. We met in Berlin, for the NATO meeting of speakers, Stepanchuk came. It was just the NATO, but it was, a, a, it was the G7. It was the G7 in Berlin, which then led us to Croatia, where you had what 50 speakers, members of part uh, of 55. 55 representatives of Parliament from all over the world, where we had our, shared our, shall we say enthusiasms about all of this. So he has been masterful in recognizing the role of parliaments and in terms of the U.S. and, and uh, we've had so many phone calls, Zooms, 
uh, and the rest. Uh, so there was never any doubt as to what their preferences and priorities are. And we are, feel very complimented to, to get the, the purpose. This is why we need this. This is when we need it. And uh, I'll talk to anybody about it. Mm -hmm. Step and show. So, Mr. Speaker, please. We only have a few minutes. Um, if there's any final question, I'll take it now. And then I want to give uh, uh, Speaker Stefan Chuk the, the final closing. Yes, madam, please. Hello, my name is Zanda Kalman Yulukashevitz. I'm Deputy Speaker of the Latvian Parliament. And thank you so much, Speaker Pelosi and Speaker uh, Stefan Chuk, for, for everything you said. And indeed, it's important for us to continue. Uh, political, financial, military support to Ukraine as much as possible. But as we are approaching uh, a symbolic milestone, the 24th of uh, February, uh, if I may, at the my conclusion of, of this discussion, ask both of you rather personal question. If you would compare how you personally felt like a day before the February 24th last year and uh, how it is today. Um, so knowing what's ahead and also seeing how the year has uh, passed. Uh, if you could share uh, with us, and maybe that could help to raise uh, additional support internationally, uh, indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, would you, is there another question? I didn't see another question. Mr. Mr. Chairman, would you like to start? Please. Uh, thank you. To, uh, uh, to Honorable Speaker Pelosi, I just want to say and remind that on the 24th of February last year, the first call that I made was to Speaker Pelosi. And I'm grateful for the words that you told me then. You told me, stay strong. The United States are with you. We will support you. And this throughout this year you have never failed uh, to do that and thank you very much for this uh, call I called you from the bomb shelter with, which was one of the buildings of the Parliament of Ukraine I will remember that all my life your calm words your honest and sincere words of support meant a lot to me and since that time we've passed this long way of joint cooperation I think this was the basis of cooperation between our parliaments, and therefore I would like to thank you personally for your leadership in this process and for your visit to Ukraine and our constant meetings that have always been accompanied with the words of good support to Ukrainian people. I know this and I value very much. Regarding how we have changed throughout the year, I would like to say that we have become more realistic. We have passed lots of phases of our perception from optimism to pessimism, now we are in realism. And we clearly understand what needs to be done to have this war ended with the victory of Ukraine. And the date, which will be golden date in the calendar of Ukraine, will de it depends on us. And this is the date of our joint victory. And it is now common possibility to do it as soon as possible. And I know that we have friends here that will do all it takes so that as soon as possible we would celebrate the big victory of good over evil. And also I would like to say a couple of words regarding the, the question. I, I forgot, sorry. But I'll end at this. So thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thank you for this. Have the final word. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for your kind words. Yes, when he called me that first time, he was in. He said, "I have to. I can't talk too long because they're bombing or whatever." whatever. In any event, um, it was a, a uh, sincere and honest relationship between the members of Congress and the speaker and other members of parliament who are here. But let me just say, when that day, to your question, uh, Madam Speaker, to that, on that day, we heard uh, President Zelensky speak and he challenged the, uh, as I said earlier, he challenged the, uh, uh, the um, security structure of 
the, the free world, why weren't we there? Uh, would they be there and all of that? He was just remarkable and so brave to have just come out of Ukraine, come make that speech and leave. So we were overwhelmed by his bravery and hoping that um, obviously for the best and how could, of course, we would be there for them. Uh, this was about sovereignty. It was about not respecting borders. It was more of a, a, a pure kind of thing. For a long time now, I've had a really difficult time trying to understand why the world is not up in arms about using women, rape of women, kidnapping of children as a weapon of war. I, I just have seen and heard so many stories, many parliamentarians, grassroots activists and the rest have come to visit us in the Capitol and bring these stories. And to think that, um, that this outbreak, I mean, it would take too long to go into all of raping people in front of their children or in front of their parents, uh, dismembering them in front of their family. It, it's brutal. And when I said to a, per, a Russian expert, this war is turning these Russian soldiers into animals. It's just terrible. I guess that's what war does to you. They said, make no mistake. Those soldiers don't do anything they're not ordered to do. So this is the, regime, the government is responsible for this. So in any event, it's now in more of an emotional response of if only everybody was aware of it, how could they vote against a resolution uh, uh, criticizing, or more than that, the Russians at the United Nations? How could everybody not just say that this is behavior outside the circle of civilized human behavior? So more emotional, more uh, sort of not unemotional, but more, uh, less emotional than now. And, and just want to just close by praising our president, uh, President Joe Biden. I'll try to do this briefly. When I was a student, I was at John Kennedy's inauguration. And everybody in the world, or any, all Americans know that in that speech, he said to the citizens of America, ask not what you can do for your, what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Kids learn that in school. Everybody knows it, even if their parents weren't even born then. Um, the next line, though, in the speech is what I remembered as a student. The next line, he said, to the citizens of the world, ask not what America can do for you, but what we can do working together for the freedom of mankind. And I believe that Joe Biden was having a Kennedy-esque time, era, moment, uh, in the manner in which he worked with countries, not in condescension, not in saying this is how we would do it, but listening and building consensus among the NATO nations, and first and foremost, listening to the Ukrainians, uh, working together for the freedom of mankind. That is what this is about, and that's why we're all so grateful to the Ukrainian people for fighting for the freedom of mankind there and in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing that, Madam Speaker. Thank you for your courage, for the courage of the Ukrainian people. Uh, I may mention to you a last word from me before we close out that I, I'm from Ukraine originally. I grew up um, outside of Atlanta, Georgia in the United States and I'm now in Washington. Uh, but I was recently given a bracelet that I'm wearing all the time now uh, from one of the members of your parliament, Alexei Hanchelenko, who's also here at the Munich Security Conference. And uh, it's made with the bullets uh, that were used in the Battle of Kiev at the beginning of the war when we thought Kiev was going to fall. And I truly do wear it now to remind myself to not forget um, and to remember what you were talking about, Madam Speaker, the emotional side of this brutal, brutal, cruel war. Um, watching what has happened to my hometown in Kiev has been really difficult, even as we all try to compartmentalize um, so that uh, we don't have emotional breakdowns every day. And I think the courage of the Ukrainian people and their steadfast commitment to victory is what carries all of us through um, our day-to-day -day lives. Um, but it's a good reminder, and I appreciate uh, you saying that. 
and you have the same <laughs> one. So Alexei has gone to you too. Close to our hearts. Very Close good. To our hearts, yes. Thank you for wearing it, and thank you everyone for being part of this conversation. Thank you, Congressman Connolly, for all of your work in the U.S. Congress to support Ukraine. Uh, and I think many of you probably have dinners, so thank you. Please join me in a final round of applause.